Welcome to the OC Bitches, Season 4, Episode 4, The Metamorphosis. Hi, Mindy. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> I'm staring at I'm staring at our at our out- outline. How are you? I'm good. I'm st- I'm stuck at home today. My daughter's sick, guys. So we're a little at odds, but that's okay. So happy to be here and to be going over this episode with the one and only Norman Buckley to joining us again. Yay! Hey, you guys. <laughs> Hi. It's nice, it's nice to be back. Thanks for having me back. We love when you're on. So we're so happy you were willing to come back and talk about this episode that you directed, The Metamorphosis. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. It's one of my favorites of the ones that I directed. I I, I really think it's a good episode on many different levels. I love these episodes. There's something so... I was smiling. I was going with the flow. Of course, I was m- remembering all the dancing. And um, I just can see <laughs> there's some new energy and... And, and I just remember having so much fun in this episode. I'd love to get into it. Can we get into it? Yeah, let's read the synopsis. Summer, soul searches during a visit from Seth. Taylor pleads for Ryan's help with her marriage. And Sandy longs for a guy's night. Julie vows to turn over a new leaf in moving on from Marissa's death. Written by Lila Gerstein. Woo! Directed by Norman Buckley. Woohoo! Original air date, November 16th, 2006. Wow. It's been wow. it's been that long. <laughs> We're still yep. going. We're still going. Well, so the episode opens with what I consider one of the actually more iconic moments of the entire season. And it's it's basically Rachel, Rachel, but it's it is Rachel, but it's summer. <laughs> you know, Julie in the last episode, she's she and Ryan seem to have a little bit of closure, but we haven't seen um, with Marissa's death, but we haven't seen Summer have her reconciling. And it opens with her going to a therapist and having the five stages of grief. Do you guys remember that day? I remember that day. Um, as we were shooting it, I was actually doing the therapist lines um, off camera. <laughs> really? they, they, re- they replaced them for the episode, but... Uh, I, I remember doing it and being very self-conscious about my own performance. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's so funny. You know what? Because I don't, as everyone knows, I don't remember barely anything. I really remember doing this whole grief sequence. It was one of my favorites. It was so much fun to play around with. And I remember us being on the soundstage and the the room was built and the couch and stuff and that you were reading the lines, Norman, and I'm watching it back. And I was like, that was so much fun. I know it's grief and like she's going through a lot, but it was a lot of fun to shoot. Well, I do remember we did several different things. Like we, as I remember it, you would try it one way and then you would try it a different way. And and we, and we uh, experimented. There was a little bit of improv going on, as I, <laughs> as I recall. Is that the way that you remember it, too? Yeah, I think like especially with the depression and I start wailing like comically and cartoon like where I'm like, ah, <laughs> yeah, you know, and I think that was definitely improv. And I love that that's what we used because I just thought it was yes. funny. And, and, you know, I noticed <laughs> yeah. that the background music was like a string quartet. And even though this grief is very serious, but, you know, it's as much a part of life just as like comedy is. So there was still this like light feeling and it had that perfect balance of lightness and drama, which is really what describes the OC, don't you think? I mean, just the way it was put together. Well, I definitely think that. I, th- I think it's always, I think I've talked about on the podcast with you guys before that um, I always, the thing I liked about the show was the balancing of the, of the comedy with pathos. And then it could flip back and forth in a moment. And, the, the, you know, there's a certain kind of melancholy to this episode as there was so my the last episode I remember talking to you guys about you know the 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 show the show could have kind of a melancholy undercurrent and and yet it's still very funny at the same time which i think is a is a real fine balancing act right hey rachel i actually spent some time yesterday trying to figure out what all your t-shirts said and i had to like stop it <laughs> they they start with um i wish i was canadian suv <laughs> equals WMD, which is Weapons of Mass Destruction, uh, Biodiesel turns me on, love your Mother Earth, impeach him, and I love trees. Took me a while to figure that out. But <laughs> Oh my gosh, well, who would I want? Who was president then? Bush. George Bush. Oh, <laughs> W. Bush. 
Thanks, guys. George right. W. Bush. That's so funny. I want to be Canadian. And then I kind of was for a while. Right. <laughs> Foreshadowing, perhaps. Right, right. Oh, that's so funny. The activist oh, t-shirts. So That's right. In case you didn't know, we right. nail it on the head. <laughs> so that all happened in a week, you know, so which is very, very, you know, so when Summer puts her mind to something, it happens very quickly. So <laughs> I, I wish we could all have that much. So so then we cut straight to Seth. He's at Brown and he's calling Ryan because he's worrying about he's assuming Summer's going to dump him and Ryan's trying to calm him down. And all of a sudden we get the slow-mo <laughs> version of Summer. And the wonderful song, Hello, Sunshine. Yeah. And you look stunning and the hair's Aww. flowing. And it was such a sweet moment. And I feel like not only did Seth say, my baby's back, the audience probably said the same. <laughs> don't you think? Yeah, I think so. You know what I noticed? <laughs> I like It's a different version of Hello, Sunshine. And that was the song mm-hmm. that played when we lost our virginity to each other. Right. And... It was such a good cover. And when I was watching it, I realized, like, right as I'm about to kiss him, I, like, put my finger up to my lips, like, shh, and then just, like, do it. <laughs> and I remember just doing that. And I was just paying attention to, like, the little things I used to do. What does that What does that mean? What's the finger Just, mean? like, don't talk. I'm going to kiss you. Like, oh. my finger to my lips. Like, don't say a word. Right, right. And, and because every time we've seen them together since Marissa's death, it has been absolutely been the most awkward situation. So yes. all of a sudden it's this, it, and it is an interesting thing just with a little bit of with, with the music and the editing and the attitude and the clothing, how much different it looks than, than the way we've seen summer recently. But of course, yeah. then they, then they go and have, um, I guess their post coital and he <laughs> says, wow, that was better than I imagined. And she's like, you're imagining this? Of course men, well, of course men do that. But, uh, <laughs> But he's like, no, I thought you were going to like literally break up with me. And so he hands you season three of The Valley. And because if the, if it doesn't, if it wasn't going to work out, he wanted, he had a plan. He did. <laughs> because The Valley was going to bring you back too. But also I noticed that you use the same music under that as you did from the, for the beginning. And as an editor, you get to choose that music. Did you have anything to do with that as you're directing as well? Well, I did somewhat. I mean, this episode was uh, edited by Tim Good, who had been one of my assistants uh, coming up. And um, um, I remember this was the first season that I wasn't actually in the editing room anymore. I was only directing in in the fourth season. And uh, I still had a very proprietary attitude about the editing of the show, even though I wasn't uh, editing anymore. And um, uh, Tim was very uh, he, he he was very aggressive in terms of his choices about editing, and so I remember that we butted heads a lot because uh, there was a, a, a tendency of his to to want to do it all on his own, and there was a tendency of mine to still want to control it. So I do remember that there were a lot of discussions back and forth about the way that we um, played with the music in this. Uh, I will say that in in looking at it again. I feel like a lot of the really great ideas in the episode were his, mm-hmm. and a lot of the music choices were his. Uh, I do remember uh, for the very final montage, I I picked a much more melancholy song, uh, uh, this song by Jeff Trott called The Few That Remain. And I, I always thought that it was really sad that they replaced it. But I'm looking at the episode again. I'm really glad they replaced it because that would have been far too um, yeah. too heavy for the end of the show. And uh, the 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 fact that I was feeling so melancholy about it, I think, was also a recognition that the show might be coming to an end at this point. And so I think I was feeling a real sense of of melancholy throughout the shooting of all the episodes in season four. I do have to take a moment to say that um, I want to thank you and all of the, ed- you know, the editors that have come on because you guys tend to have some of the best story behind the scenes stories. When Matt Ramsey was on last, he admitted that when Johnny Harper was falling, that you had suggested something else and he wanted to do it his own way. And he wished <laughs> that he had you, he had followed your direction and it would have been much better. So I can understand uh, that you guys, you guys, there's a lot of life behind the camera going on. Well, right? well I, I really saw myself as a boss in post production. I really saw myself as 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 the final word on a lot of things. And, and I mean, it's nonsense, of course. Now, 
now with 20 years, <laughs> almost 20 years hindsight, I realized how ridiculous that was. But I, I did, um, I did often tell people what I thought they should be doing. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but you know, the, the great thing about post production is it is a real collaboration and the editors, uh, on any given show are real, they're, they're really, um, uh, they're, they're creating. They're creating and they're and they're um, uh, always involved in the music choices. Mm -hmm. So I can't remember the specifics of this, but I do remember that I struggled a lot with Tim on it. But <laughs> and but and, and looking back on it, uh, Tim did great work, and I'm I'm so grateful that he was um, the editor on this particular episode because I love it a lot. Well, mm -hmm. passion passion evokes wonderful art, right? And that being <laughs> said, um, Summer's passions she's now substituting all of her activist. Um, posters with what? Devil wears Prada, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and yes. che, and Che arrives, and what does Summer have to do? She has to come true about her what she considers her true identity. Her pendulum is swung all the way back. She's coming completely clean, showing him her closet, which I, I you have the most room of any dorm I've ever seen. Or you must <laughs> live in a house, right? Yeah, but, the biggest <laughs> closet space ever. <laughs> right. This is my closet. Even the occasional calfskin, and and Che is like, I I just I love Che here, where he's he doesn't actually live with judgment. You know, it's like he's an activist right. without punishment. It was very he's sweet. So funny. I just love watching him. I'm sure you guys have already talked about him, but he was such a pleasure to work with. I remember this being so much fun. Every time he was on the set, he was just a light. And uh, I, I, I really look back on that experience as a very, very good one. Right. Because yes. I thought he was very funny. He commits. He commits. And, and as Josh <laughs> said, it's wonderful to have new people on the show with great energy. And there's so many people like Autumn, Willa, Gary Grubbs, Chris Pratt. They all came with such wonderful energy and so excited to be there. So and 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 it was infectious. But of mm -hmm. course, then um, Seth shows up and Che gets to meet Seth and he grabs him and says, your twin spirit flame, no, twin flames. Twin so flame. Seth is my machine gun Kelly. Oh, my twin. OK, sorry. So I don't get that reference. Sorry. <laughs> oh, me, uh, Megan Fox and machine gun Kelly call each other. Twin flames. Twin it's flame. Yeah. But doesn't he say twin spirit flame? But he says twin flame. I thought I said twin flame. No, right. twin flame. This is my question. And I don't know if you know the answer to this. Seth and Chris end up doing quite a few scenes together. And this is their first time together. Do you, do, do you think they planned it in the future? Or do, do they see how they interact, the writers, and then decide, like, let's continue with Che? I mean, was he supposed to be on all those episodes you remember? I, I don't remember specifically. I don't I don't remember what the, the mechanics of that were, but I do know that I felt that Adam really enjoyed those scenes with Chris Pratt. Right. I do remember feeling like his his enthusiasm and energy would come up mm -hmm. in, in those scenes. Uh, th that was my experience of it. Right. Yeah, it looks like they have a lot of fun together. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was fun. Those days were really fun on set and and very very loose and easygoing and those guys worked out a lot of their business together okay. very spontaneously. Rachel, you said that he made you laugh. Did, were you cracking? I there's so much stuff in these episodes where I'm like Rachel just must have been laughing her butt off. <laughs> yes, definitely. I mean, especially like when we get into the next episode, there were so many yeah. things that like were brought back and I was like, oh man, <laughs> he just, he's so committed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hair wash day, but you just don't have the time for the wash, dry and style routine. So you whip out the hat or slick it back into a pony or a bun for the fourth day in a row. But with Living Proof, I can go that extra day thanks to their incredible dry shampoo. Their Perfect Hair Day Advanced Clean Dry Shampoo or regular dry shampoo is a must-have between wash days. As a mom, I don't have time to wash. Listen, I may even go five or six days. Don't tell anybody. But thankfully to Living Proof's dry shampoo, no one will notice. Living Proof understand that there's no one-size-fits-all solution for all hair types and textures. That's why they develop game-changing formulations that are tailored to individual concerns, including frizz, lack of volume, and lack of curl definition. You just described my hair. I used it this morning. 
<laughs> and I'm so happy with Living Proof. I have fine, frizzy hair. And it's not easy, actually, to get it right without a professional blowout. But with this system, I can get the results I want all by myself. Living Proof's award-winning formulations are proven to make hair look and feel healthier without sacrificing integrity. Stop concealing your hair on those wash days and show off your hair's natural brilliance with Living Proof. Visit livingproof.com slash the OC and use code the OC10 to get a free travel size dry shampoo with your purchase of $45 or more. That's livingproof.com slash the OC, code the OC10 to get a free travel size dry shampoo with your purchase of $45 or more. Livingproof.com slash the OC, code the OC10. I do like a routine and in the morning, and I usually start the day with a protein shake and electrolytes, but sometimes I get bored with it, and sometimes I just crave cereal for breakfast. So with Magic Spoon, I can enjoy breakfast while I still maintain that keto lifestyle. Magic Spoon is not only keto-friendly, but also gluten-free and soy-free. They have also replicated your favorite childhood cereals to not only taste good, but each serving contains zero grams of sugar and 13 to 14 grams of protein. As kids, we all ate cereal like for an after-school snack or dessert or even a midnight snack. And that's how I treat my magic spoon. It's there whenever I want a taste of that childhood treat. Fruity's my favorite. Adam likes the cinnamon and CG loves frosted. Well, Briar and I love the fruity flavor, but magic spoon also has cocoa, peanut butter, blueberry muffin, honey nut, cookies and cream, and cinnamon roll. Also the super popular previously limited edition birthday cake is back. Cannot wait to try this one out. Head to magicspoon.com slash the OC to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try the magic for yourself. And be sure to use our promo code the OC at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product. It's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash the OC and use the code the OC to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. So then um, you guys are watching TV and it's so funny, again, to watch the subtitles where Summer's like, I don't like the show anymore. They're <laughs> talking about, you know, things that are, they're fake problems for fake people, distracting from the important issues. And in the... um. I was like, oh, she doesn't like season three. What is this commenting on? Because in the subtitles, it's the character is saying he tore his ACL and he'll never kickbox again because it's like a Johnny Harper type character. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And then the season three thing, obviously, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> that meta that thing. A lot of right meta there. stuff. A lot Very of meta, meta. stuff. Yeah. But, then, but yes. then she decides, she's like, I need to go check out. I need to find out what's going on with Justin Timberlake and, and Lindsay and Lindsay Cameron Lohan Diaz. And Cameron. Oh, gosh. And Doesn't that date us? That was a real In Touch magazine. Do they obviously have to get permission for that? If it's a real magazine, yes, they would have had to get uh, the rights signed off on that. Yeah. Do those still exist? I think so. I think they like, do. In touch. I think I, I'm trying to picture at the airport, like when you're in the newsstand, what is still there. I know people's well, there. And barely feels like magazines still it's, exist. So uh, I don't know. I know. But it was so crazy seeing, you know, all these in touch and the stories of the time. It really does like take you back, you know, and and I, I knew I, I would always buy them <laughs> when <laughs> I was traveling back in those days. Well, uh, the show is such a time capsule. The the fact that people had flip phones and yeah. and um, little Nokia phones, I, I I forgot all that. You know, right? I keep expecting to see somebody with an iPhone, and nobody has one yet because <laughs> they hadn't been invented. So. Well, the, right. the stars pumping gas just like us was a real feature. Stars and just like nowadays that, that just would like be us. so boring because we do so many normal things on social media, <laughs> right? It's it's so yeah. funny that that was like such a big deal. It was such a paparazzi culture where they just like caught you doing anything and everything. Right. Yeah. And now it's like you control what you put out there more and there's just so much content. <laughs> right, right. In it's, Touch is still alive and well, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that I do really love about this whole sequence of scenes is this idea of uh, the, the title of the show being the metamorphosis is that everybody's changing that everybody's going through some type of some type of change and and i do think that uh it's interesting to watch uh, summer's evolution in this episode to see that she the things that used to excite her the things that used to be really interesting to her so again beneath the comedy there's there's something 
really, I don't know, maybe it's too much to say it's philosophical, but it is. It's philosophical, just about the nature of growing up and how your your interests change. And and Seth keeps making that point about, I get it, you're at, you're, you know, because they go on this shopping trip and she comes back and he's like, is everything okay? Because apparently she threw something on some, quote, for, faux fur. And she spent one day in her old what she thought was was her the real her back to the real her and she couldn't do it she had to people don't have to be just one thing change is difficult but it's also we can be so many things we can be completely full of acti- activism and still want to know celebrity gossip you know she's got this <laughs> amazingly hideous sweater or did you like it i don't i don't see how i could have <laughs> okay <laughs> I was like i d- I didn't want to say, I mean, at first when you picked it up, I'm like, oh, I wonder. But it, I think it's more the shape, too, like what it looks like. I don't like. know what it is. <laughs> the details that in every department are always so good. Well, I think it was important that it not be a sweater that she likes, yeah. such that the joke plays at the end of the of the act, I think, when she says no. You know, when he asks mm-hmm. her if she likes the sweater and she says no. I think if it had been some really cute sweater, that that would have been uh, right. a flat joke. Right, so. right, right. So, yeah, so she can't help herself. She's calling Che and saying, what's going on? Because that that really gets her going, right? And then Seth finds Che and he's offering the Baba Ganesh. The Baba Ganesh. Baba Ganesh. (laughs) (laughs) But then all of a sudden he hears Summer, who uh, has returned to her newfound roots and is pumping everybody up about solar panels. And then Seth has this kind of like look on his face that like something smells bad. Hey, I have a question for you. You know, this kind of sparked a, a memory Whenever I've had, sometimes whenever I've had to do like a speech and in front of like, there might be 30 people or 40 people or something where you're trying to rev up that, that kind of um, encouragement speech, sometimes they can feel kind of awkward. Do you ever feel like that? A speech? Well, oh, when you have to be like, well, and then this is going to happen and this is going to happen. Tomorrow we march. <laughs> right, right. Sometimes uh, it can be a little bit on the, um, they can be challenging. I just find, I don't know. I just, yeah, had, had I can hear that. I also feel like I think I just lean into it more and maybe even make it a little bit bigger just because. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, but I, I te- definitely hear you. Right. So she has found this. She's found her way back. And then what happens? Oh, God. Well, when Seth calls Ryan to to say, I don't know what's going on with her, her personality and this and that, and she overhears and he instantly hangs up and she's it's not, it's it just happens, right? She's still going to mm-hmm. be involved, and she's just saying, you know, this is, you know, this is just who I am. And he's like, I get it. It's okay. You're trying to figure this out. But then, of course, what does he do next? He goes to Che. And how do we find Che, everybody? <laughs> I'm like completely <laughs> naked just for the sake of being naked. Do you remember shooting this, Norman? This scene? I certainly, I certainly remember shooting it. Yes. Um, <laughs> Because he was naked and it was, you know, it was a closed set. And I remember uh, just trying to make sure that he felt comfortable. And he was like, yeah, sure. I'm fine. Let's shoot. Really? <laughs> what did he have? Was, just uh, like a little cloth over him? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. sock. They do the, the, the sock. The mm-hmm. sock. <laughs> that was it. But um, which, think- I mean, given the, given the shots we did, I don't know why that was really necessary. But I think that actually we showed a little bit more skin than actually you see in the finished cut. So it may be that we pushed the boundary a little bit and then Fox pushed back and said, no, you have to trim that back. Because I do remember that he was he, he had nothing on. And um, I don't know why, given the way the scene is cut, that we would have done that. Right. If that's what we're going to use. So I do think we probably had a cut that was a little more aggressive. I guess you can't show like the whole backside on network television. Is that correct? I think that probably is what we tried to do and we're we're shot down. Mm -hmm. So it it was definitely funnier, though, if if, if you'd been able to use those wide shots a little more. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's a funny image. Uh, we should re-release that, it on a streaming service. Was that Chris's <laughs> song? Did he just impro- improv that? Oh, the polar bear? Yeah. Dad, dad, dad. I feel like the song was probably written. Uh, but he I just, think he probably just came up with the tune. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. It's so good. And then it, he hugs it, it, feels, him. it feels like Lila's writing to me. So so <laughs> then, then apparently Che uh, turns a caterpillar into a butterfly and gets Seth on board. 
and wants to join them at the, um, I guess, what do you call it, the rally at the auditorium to go before the school board. And he, he doesn't get let in. But he's like, no problem. I get it. You go. You're changing the world. And um, which is kind of sad. But then it turns out that he's on the bench, like sleeping, waiting for her. And but but of course, Che's got a he's planned a filibuster. So it's going to take all night. And Mm -hmm. uh, he decides to leave early with this beautiful little, you know, he's got he says, I'm going to take a cue from you and leave early. And he draws you a picture. And and I my first thought was like, why leave early? Um, Is it passive aggressive or was it just like, I'm going to give you space? I mean, it really was genuine, right? I think it's sweeter than that. I think there was a real sweetness about it that. I realize I'm kind of a parachuting into your life here and you've got a life here mm-hmm. and I'm going to let you have your life here. Right. That's the way I read it. Yeah, I read it as loving and just su- mm. supporting her. Like that's actual support. I thought that was a very sweet scene. And I remember shooting that one too. I thought it was really lovely mm. the, the, when he's on the bench and you come out and talk to him. I like that scene a lot. It was beautifully shot and it had a mm-hmm. like, I'm really enjoying the Seth Summer stuff here as the maturity and the growth and, and the metamorphosis. You can literally see that happening in these scenes. <gasps> che calls her caterpillar. Sorry. Yeah. Just metamorphosis. I just yeah. caterpillar. <laughs> I think maybe we don't hear it till the next episode, but right. hey, it's still right. a track. Caterpillar, <laughs> butterfly, metamorphosis, all that. <laughs> so let's move on to Ryan and Taylor Ryan and, and Taylor. that whole thing. Woohoo. This was a good this was a good storyline and this was this is really the first of the episodes that kind of developed their whole relationship for season mm-hmm. four in this in this romantic way. Right. And this was a lot of fun to shoot, this whole French storyline. Well, I yeah, enjoyed it, it's, it a lot. There's quite a bit coming up in, in but I mean in the future, but you know, we open on Ben looking good. Running down the beach. It was a nice day of shooting. We got it. We had a beautiful day on the beach, and that was uh, uh, it. Was a, a lot of fun to shoot that scene. Right, right. Just, just look good with the wind in your hair, Ben. Yeah, and right. Sandy. Sh- it. Sandy shows up, and we're going to see that we see this throughout the f- few episodes. Sandy is. I put myself in like a teenage. I put myself in Ryan's shoes of like God. If my parent was checking on in on me that much, it could get annoying. But Sandy is a good, persistent parent. Checking in on him. How you doing? Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. He's got a new job at the, what is it called? The El Pavo Guapo, the handsome turkey. And he's mm-hmm. like, I'm just, and apparently, and also letting the audience know that he gets to go to Berkeley later on. So there's some exposition there. And Sandy's going to be stopping by for shrimp tacos, which are very healthy, by the way, if you go to a Mexican restaurant. It's one of the lower calorie things. I just want to put that out there. (laughs) (laughs) Finally, there is a solution to organizing your fast paced boss babe lifestyle with the weekender bag from base. Gone are the days of having to sacrifice style for function. You're able to keep track of all your things. Hello, key leash and laptop sleeve, while also dressing to impress everywhere that you go. Easily transition from day to night, boardroom to bar with base. Base was created by actress Shay Mitchell to make sleek and affordable bags, luggage, and accessories designed to help you travel effortlessly while still looking fashionable. Their luggage comes in multiple sizes and colors. I love the weekend bag I have. My favorite is the separate compartment at the bottom. I'm always a fan of that because that's where you can put your shoes. But not only shoes, it fits so much extra stuff underneath. It was the perfect bag for my weekend. Base has thought of everything you could ever want in a piece of luggage. 360-degree gliding wheels, a cushioned handle, built-in weight indicator, washable bags for your dirty clothes, and all the interior pockets you need to keep organized. I am so happy to be introduced to Base. I have been using the beautiful navy weekender bag and when i go to oc to see my mom on the weekends i call it my oc bag i literally say hey honey get my week my oc bag out of the garage it's the perfect size for a quick weekend and it's the perfect size actually for a set bag too Rachel, Mm -hmm. what a beautiful product. And it's a beautiful, beautiful product line. Right now, Base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash OC. Go to basetravel.com slash OC for 15% off your first purchase. That's B-E-I-S travel.com slash OC. 
My life can get a little hectic sometimes, but thankfully, Daily Harvest does more so I can do less. Think stress-free meals delivered to your doorstep, aka they have my back. Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, soups, flatbreads, snacks, smoothies, lattes, and more built on organic fruits and vegetables. Daily Harvest works directly with farmers to source the best ingredients, freezes them at peak ripeness to lock in flavor and nutrients, and they never use artificial preservatives or ingredients. I love to cook, but sometimes I don't have the time or I just don't want to mess up my kitchen. Mm. And it's nice to know that I have some whole delicious food in the freezer. Everything is so delicious. It doesn't actually stay in the freezer very long, though. (laughs) I just love how easy and convenient the smoothies in the morning before school and my daughter loves them. It's the perfect combination of fast, easy, nutritious. With Daily Harvest, I never have to think twice about what to eat for my next meal, snack, or dessert. Everything stays fresh in my freezer until I'm ready to enjoy it, helping me reduce food waste. Let Daily Harvest do more so you can do less. Go to dailyharvest.com slash the OC to get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash the OC for up to $40 off your first box. dailyharvest.com slash the OC. Taylor has received a package from her French hubby and... Okay, I have to stop right here because I'm trying to remember because I, I haven't watched the episodes right in front of this. Why is Taylor suddenly living with Julie and Caitlin in Summer's house? I, I, <laughs> I remember that being the case, but I was like, what was the mechanics of that happening? I don't that remember. sounds confused. looks very confused. So she was in France. Mm-hmm. And she shows up to Brown and then she shows or she's in Orange County and she shows up to Brown, but she's married this Frenchman who she doesn't want to live with anymore. And then when she confronts her mother, her mother is so angry. It's like, what are you doing here? She's supposed to be at the Sorbonne. And her mother apparently kicks her out. So when this episode opens, she's at Julie's. And my that was my question. I'm like, she, she stayed at the Coens one night and then all of a sudden the I guess what's developed is she's taken over Summer's room. I can't remember if I'm right about this, but I feel like uh, at this point, we weren't completely sure that we were going to be canceled. And they were trying a lot of different combinations of things to see (laughs) what would possibly be an interesting season five, if we'd gone to season five. Oh. Uh, and I might be wrong about this, but I do feel like the introduction of the twins, um, Luke's brothers, mm-hmm. and then the, the combination of um, Caitlin and, and, and uh, Taylor and Julie living together in a house. I feel like there was some experimentation going on, trying to see what, what various permutations might work for the future. I could be wrong about that, but... That's an interesting thing in television. Mm -hmm. You literally put, let's write some scenes with these characters and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think... See what the chemistry is. Yeah, I think Josh was saying that they had all kinds of ideas, but the one thing that kind of sealed the deal for us being canceled was that just the ratings just weren't that there in season four. So I feel feel like at this point, it was the fourth episode of season four, they were still hoping that there might be a version of the show that would continue. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, even even some type of, um, I can't remember if they'd ever talked about a spinoff, but I do know that there was, you know, like, let's combine different elements. Hmm. And I do know there was some interest in those young boys as being really? maybe a continuing element. Yeah. I think Josh said something like, after it was either episode three or four, he kind of knew it would be over, but maybe it was just kind of mm-hmm. like, Still right. around the time where they were figuring it out. And after yeah, this, I think like, so. yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. It, there's some after things going on that you can see the creativity and the energy of season four were kind of infectious for all of us. But if the ratings weren't there, that kind of that kind of was was the decision, I guess, so mm-hmm. to speak. So so then what happens? Then what happens? Well, she receives a package from her French hubby, right? Right. We said that. Henri, Henri Michel. So she goes searching um, for Seth, right? She's looking for Seth for help, and then she sees Ryan working at the ugly turkey. No, what is it? The, the what turkey? The handsome turkey. The handsome. I automatically went ugly, you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> right, right. who wouldn't want to eat at a restaurant called the ugly turkey? Right. Beats me. And do you guys remember that big set? They built yes. that big shopping mall set. Yes. Yeah, that was the big, beautiful set. That It was huge. It was a mall, and we had sets on either side. 
and the upstairs. So it was it was quite Massive. it was quite impressive. But you know, because yes. Seth isn't around, she instantly beelines for Ryan to help her. She needs some kind of help because and explains that I need you to help me because my husband's coming and I want to divorce him and I need support because if I see him, it's all very sexual and I won't know what to do with myself and I won't be able to control myself and and because he's a sensual Jedi and she's desperate. And so he, I guess, eventually agrees to show up and help her. But, um, you know, I just love her dialogue. This You can tell the writers are excited about writing for her character. And, you know, when they're at the bar and She's so nervous and she's like, so tell me about cage fighting. I was thinking about getting into that. You know, <laughs> all of these things are just so done, done so well with her character. And and this guy walks in and she says, oh, it's not Henri Michel, it's his lawyer, who, by mm-hmm. the way, is William, I think you say Ab- 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 Abadi, Abadi, and he's a... He's, Abadi, is, I remember. Abadi. Yeah. He's gone on to do, he's in, he's on Emily in Paris. Right now, he's done oh. quite a few things. I was like, I recognize him. So he's got quite I a I thought I recognized him, too. He was okay. on Gossip Girl. He was on Chuck and Sex in the City as well. Well, who was he on Sex in the City? You know? He played Tony or something on Sex in the City. Anyway, maybe you, maybe Katie could tell us. But And also, oh. Autumn speaks fluent French. She's a Francophile. She, she lived in France. She... Oh, she's actually speaks. She actually yes. speaks French. In That's her real why life. these scenes work so well. She's. I know. I was like, "Geez, her accent, like everything." I was so impressed yes. with her French. She lived there, and um, anyway, so they have this discussion. She's wonderful too with with uh, Ben. I feel like their chemistry was very mm-hmm. good, and she really, um, I felt, um, uh, brought his game up in some of these scenes. Yeah, he seemed to be having fun. He was smiling and he it was yeah. almost like, you know, oh, there's so many moments where we're like, God, Taylor is so weird or she's strange. She even says it about herself. But I can see Ryan actually kind of being entertained by her. And even yes. though he's in this very a place in his life where he's processing all this grief that she he makes her she makes him smile. And it's a great, I, great distraction. I feel like this was the episode, too. I, I could be wrong you guys can correct me if i am but i feel like this was the episode where she really starts to make a transition to being more of the the romantic foil for him right. you know mm-hmm. as opposed to um just being the the goofy weird character that she was in season three right. i feel like that there's a larger feeling component to her character as this season rolls along and i feel like this is the episode where she really became like a romantic lead, mm-hmm. if you will. Mm-hmm. Well, and they yeah, did I, it very gently, slowly, I think, mm-hmm. for the audience. Because the audi- they knew the audience was sensitive to Ryan moving on. And, and they were very mm-hmm. aware of that, don't you feel? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I love her storyline, her and Ryan. Yes. Like, yes, the chemistry's there. Mm-hmm. But just, it's, she has so much fun stuff to do. As I'm watching it, mm-hmm. I'm like, this is it. Like, this is the thing. And I, I just think she's doing fantastic. Right. So in the meantime, yeah, she tells the lawyer that she um, has she has a lover and he says Im- impossible and walks out. And Ryan's like, what, what were you guys talking about? Oh, I just told him that you like soccer. And he, he's yeah, I, I like soccer. There's just something very sweet about it. <laughs> and then, you know, she finds him and she wants him to sign this document that just says, you know, attest to her character. And he's he, of course, he won't just do it. Because he wants to know what it is. And she's like, you don't speak French at all. And, you know, she's she's totally, um, you know, she's trying to manipulate him to do this. But I would do the same thing. He wants to know what this thing says. And he's trying to translate it because there is no Google Translate, right? So he's trying to translate it. And uh, and he, Taylor wants him to sign it. And he's like, well, what, what about this? And, and it doesn't say that we slept together 30 times. Yeah. But, but then he's like, I'm not going to do it. and she goes into this speech that's super vulnerable about the she wolf that raised her and you know the f- the first guy that's nice to me you know all this all, all this stuff but she's like i just i'm sorry i can only handle this job right now and i can't do it so he has she walks away very sad and um but you know what vulnerability is Ryan's kryptonite i got to say this is one of the best kisses the oc's ever done je vous préviens je me suis entraîné à ne pas réagir au là sorry i'm late Take a chance on me. 
Yeah, that paper for me to sign. When he runs up to her, grabs her, and just plants one, it was a great kiss. And then bops her on the nose. Oh, the little boop yes. was my favorite. <laughs> he boops her. He boops her. I'm a sucker for a boop. There's another kiss later on that didn't compare to this. And my, I, I just thought there was something really yeah. hot about it. And and she's and she's grabbing onto his arm, and he tries. He has to peel her arm away. Because <laughs> wait, did Ryan do the boop on his own, Norman, or was that a suggestion from you? I I don't remember suggesting anything like that. So I think it probably was something he did on his own, That's or so it was cute. scripted, and one or the other. It wasn't. It wasn't my suggestion. No. I can't imagine like writing boop in there, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think it was I was I think it was something he did on his own. Yeah. So cute. Yeah. It, there was some it was a hot kiss. And I mean, it actually it worked so well for the scene because the lawyer's like, oh, you don't even have to sign. I can see it. I can see true love as a as a Frenchman. I uh, guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so cute. Then, of course, she comes in, you know, after because, she, you know, when he she said something like, what's your favorite fruit? And he said peaches. And she starts talking about her, how he called her breast peaches. And yes. Wait, how Autumn takes a moment when the lawyer is like saying he misses his peaches or whatever. And Autumn yeah. plays that moment so perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> she really did. Oh that's God. one of my that's one of my favorite scenes ever is, oh. is when she's when she's taking in all that stuff from the lawyer and they're speaking back and forth in French. Yes. And also just Ben's responses, his deadpan responses because he doesn't know what's going on. But I think it's great. It's so good. I'm really fangirling Autumn. She wants to, of course, pay him back, you know, any any excuse to show up. And she brings him, he's like, Oh, you don't have to do anything for me. But she's like, I brought you a peach tort. And then she claims that she took cl- cl- uh, cooking lessons and that she failed them. I don't believe that. She's she's that's out of character. But <laughs> um, but there was something really, really sweet about this scene and how Ryan just starts kind of going with it. And this is like this is a really good tort. And one of the things that she says at the end, I really love when she says, isn't life exciting not knowing what's going to happen? This is the moment where he really starts to let go of his grief about Marissa. Yeah. And uh, I think that that was one of the reasons why originally I had a much a much more melancholy song in there that was kind of, you know, tracking that line of the subtext. Right. It's a very sweet scene. And I really do feel like it's that moment that he feels like, oh, yeah, there's still a reason to, to carry on and there are still relationships to participate in. I do love how the the writers are developing this very gently. And I mean, Taylor can be a force of nature, but yeah. I think there's still respect for the just the, moving this for this storyline forward in a gentle way. I'm very excited very about exciting. it. Very exciting. But then we go on to the shenanigans of the of Julie Cooper and and Minnie Cooper. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> this is so funny when she's talking to Neil because the last thing she said to Neil Norman was she's like, I want you out of this house. And he says, it's my house. And Julie says, we'll see about that. <laughs> but so she, they're on the phone together and he's, she's like, well, Neil, that's very generous. Thank you. And she hangs up. She's like, Neil says we could stay as long as we want. And it <laughs> seems so out of the norm. But all I can think is it's an invest. It's an investment. He he might want to come back, and it's also Summer's house. She's only at school temporarily, mm. but she. But he still has a big heart, and he doesn't want to kick Julie out. And he'd rather have someone taking care of the house, like a good house sitter. And, right? and it's a uh, it's a, a convenient plot device for sets we'd already built. And uh, right, you know, there are <laughs> how do we? How do we <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at our budget. We're not building another house. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yes, that's when Caitlin starts talking about you need to find another rich guy. And Julie's like, is that what I'm teaching you? And so they make a deal. You, Caitlin will stay out of trouble. Julie will stay away from men. And, you know, what's interesting was like, it's like, well, Julie, she's never really been single. She's always she's moved from Jimmy to Caleb to um back to Jimmy and then she's got <laughs> Neil. So we've never seen her in her, like I have no attachments really. And I think they took it. I was like, she's a little nutty with this uh, <laughs> coming it's up. It's very here. funny. I yeah. love this whole storyline with Julie and uh, her cougarisms. Right. Right. <laughs> when Julie and Kirsten are at the mall at the new shopping mall 
and she's talking about giving up men. And she, <laughs> this is a pretty iconic line. She's like, well, men are like are like um, Chardonnay. Uh, with you, Kirsten, one sip and I'm upside down on a chandelier. Not that you've ever done it. And they run into Taryn, who's apparently hanging out with younger men. And Julie, she's like, All I just I just want what other people have. And she's she gets um, asked out, I guess, apparently to go out clubbing with uh, with Taryn, who looks like a little cougar herself. Right. Well, yes. Well, <laughs> well yes. <laughs> So. Absolutely. I did quite a, you know, I remember I did, I, I directed her several times on the show. She was also in the second season because mm-hmm. that's when I started directing. And uh, she was in the key I party. I directed her in that. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then I directed her in this too. She always played that character that was a little, um, a, a little bit of a bad influence. Yeah. And uh, Julie Cooper. She's the, yeah, she was at the key party. She's the cougar. She's, yeah. She was always that. She played that role well. So she gets invited out. There's that. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. to, of course, that gets Julie's, you know, mind, you know, going. And in the meantime, Caitlin and the twins have an idea to get an ID. But that would put that. Would... Everybody had fake IDs in high school, right? Well, you know, and guess, you know, the kids are doing the way they're doing it now. They're getting them from yeah. China. And what? they're exact. They're real. Like the strip and everything what? works. Yeah. Well. You know, I got I got some I know some people yeah, in college. Inside info there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's my my anyway. I'm not naming names. Noted. <laughs> I shouldn't speak. But anyway, so um, you know, Kirsten so Caitlin's already she's like fine. She's already breaking her her bet. She's losing on her bet. And then Kirsten and Julie, this was kind of a funny scene where she Julie's like she's chomping at the bit it's almost like she's you know she's pacing and you know they're talking about their new space and she's like do you want to hang and Kirsten says you want to hang out and she's like oh two women in on a Friday night whatever happened um, how 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 very whatever happened to baby Jane and then she gets Taryn Taryn asks, <laughs> that's a funny line I think that's a funny line <laughs> right and Kirsten's like or Julie Taryn says you're not only gonna be hot this long and Julie whips out her I had to say this is her Clinique black cherry lipstick thing that went oh <laughs> that I remember this because it just was rediscovered by this generation and it went viral on TikTok recently and it got <laughs> sold out. And I'm like, we were using that back then. Anyway. That's right. But uh yeah, she totally bails on Kirsten, which is kind of a this is where I thought, okay, Julie really does have a problem. If Kirsten has a problem with alcohol, Julie does have a problem <laughs> with men. You belong in a slaw meeting. Yeah. Well, J- Julie has a problem with lying. She lies a lot. I noticed, you know. <laughs> I mean, I I wrote, I was like sneaky Julie needs some therapy because, you know, she's even though she's so strong, she's very susceptible about what other people say. Taryn was able to convince her to go to go out, you know, and in the meantime, Caitlin's uh, getting an Julie item. Julie's got a lot of FOMO. There's a lot of FOMO going on a with Julie. Lot. It be, and she gets, yeah, her buttons, her buttons are pushed if somebody says you're only going to be this hot for this long. So I love, I love that you just go for it, though. I have to tell you. So you wind up going with Taryn to a club, to a club, the same club that Caitlin is trying to get into. And I love all of this so much. And I saw that you noted like when the dude comes up to you on the dance floor, I was like, wait a minute. Isn't that Artem from Dancing with the Stars? Yeah. Yes, it was. It yes. was. And he was Misha's dance partner on Dancing I with know. the Stars. And I he know. just I married that. Nikki Bella. I, I Googled him to see what was going on with him. And and I remember, so f- number one, I still have the dress because they made it for me. <laughs> the, the the costume um, designers made it um, there in-house. And we spent all day. Do you remember, Norman? We It was like a yes. whole half a day doing that because it was on set. And I met with him early in the day and we choreographed some dance. Uh And of course, only a little bit of it gets in there. But it's I I started thinking in this episode, I was like, Julie Cooper is starting to like rub off on me a little bit (laughs) (laughs) in real life, because this is I mean, I I love to go dance. I actually had a friend who was a ballroom dancer. But back in the 90s, we used to go out ballroom dancing just like that. And uh, just like that. Yeah, I don't really put we, ballroom dancing and those moves in the same sentence. <laughs> well, yeah, we'd go salsa dancing and, and that okay. kind of stuff. So it was, you know, yeah, it was it's super fun. So that was 
I fit right into that. But I thought it was so funny because she literally is hanging upside down when Caitlin walks in. And I love the direction that we look at each other upside down. So it's like, did I see her or not? Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's something that I. That's one of the. That's one of the sequences that's still on my demo reel, uh, on uh, IMDb because I like it so much. I, I stole that shot from a movie, and I remember saying, "I want her to be upside down. Can we can we stage this so that she sees her upside down?" And then trying to get all of the background extras to stay out of the way so oh. that we could get that shot of Willa you know, where it looked like she's there and then all of a sudden she's not there. Just so I probably spent 30 minutes on that, just Mm -hmm. trying to get that shot right. But uh, it's still one of my favorite sequences. I love that sequence a lot. And that whole set was, there was really no set there. It was just a couple of light boxes and black curtains on the, on the soundstage. Right. And Mm -hmm. I I told them, I said, create me a a tunnel for Willa to come through. I said, just give me a little tunnel here so that feels like she's coming in from the outside and I want to kind of fill that entrance. And then all of that was shot with, I think there were probably maybe 40 extras there, but it feels like a really crowded, wonderful club. So it's also I'm the, proud of that sequence. It's yeah. also the origin of the famous line, Julie Cooper, Urban Cougar, Rachel, that I used in a, a podcast way back and you thought I was so original and I'm never original. So <laughs> that's where it's from. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's so good. I do remember that we uh, had a lot of great songs in there and we had to cut a couple of them out because we were spending so much money in the music budget, just cutting from song to song. Oh. And so there's one in there during the tequila montage that I feel like is kind of weak, the middle one. I think there was one that was in there that was a lot more fun, right. but uh, we had to trim it back a little bit so that we could afford all the music that we did have. Right, right. Well, let's quickly um, move on to, you know, Sandy and Kirsten, Sandy's having an issue. He doesn't have any guy friends, which Mm -hmm. I started feeling like at this point, um, this isn't negative or anything, but I I was wondering if the writers are like, we we need a storyline for Sandy and Kirsten because their storyline seemed to be a little bit like not non-existent or not too. Yeah, then mm -hmm. at that point, I was wondering if that was. But in that, that being said, very busy men do have a hard time maintaining fr- friendships. They did make it really sweet where he's like, what do I do? What do I ask him out? He's like a he's like a teenage boy. And then when he finally asks Spitzy out and he's like, can I think about it? Peter's reaction is of being rejected is like, oh, God, <laughs> well, it was played so well. It was played so well. So they um, when they're on the golf course, you know, and they're, you know, they're bonding and turns out that both of they're exactly the same way. Both their wives are wondering how they're feeling and all that. Um, again, it's it's a it's a sweet storyline and it's fun to see Sandy. Although Peter is a big golfer and that golf course is right behind the studio, isn't it? Isn't it close? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It was show, it's the yeah, Marriott right behind the studio, mm. right? which we shot at a lot for a lot of different things. <laughs> oh, but I, I do like that. I, I do like what we shot there. And I do remember we, as I remember, we got a camera up on top of um, the parking garage so we could shoot oh. down at it. So we get the big wide shot. Before drones, right? Yeah, well, but, and bef- you know, just to save the money on a crane. So mm-hmm. I remember coming up with creative solutions for that kind of thing. Do you use drones a lot in your mm-hmm. directing nowadays? Just depends on the show. We use drones a lot on NCIS Hawaii. We we um, usually have a drone day for Sweet Magnolias once a season, mm-hmm. uh, or a couple of days where we go out and shoot some stuff. But drones have have really become um, ubiquitous. Yeah. So then, I guess we are at the end of the montage. Yes. Seth is at the airport. That airport was shot in the uh, cafeteria there at the studio. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was always it was, the airport. I feel like every yeah. time we were at an airport, it was the cafeteria on... In the cafeteria at the, at the studio, lot. yes. yes. <laughs> so the song they ended up picking was Love Love You Till the End, which I, I liked it. Yeah, it was... Uh, it, it was actually a much better choice than my choice. My choice was very sad. And it made the the montage a much sadder montage. But I think they were absolutely right to replace it. When I watched it again, I thought, boy, where was my hat at the time? But I thought that other song would be better. (sighs) Right. So that's when he's he's at the airport and he spent the night and Sandy comes home to play Strip Scrabble, which is cute. (laughs) Caitlin grabs the ice cream and Julie walks in. Oh, that's why he was in boxers. Yeah. (laughs) 
Okay. <laughs> he was losing a sock and pants. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He was losing. <laughs> and I love the little scene with uh, Julie and um, Caitlin, too. They, they don't say anything. The they just have ice yeah. cream. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah, really that was cute. lovely. And then Taylor leaves the pool house and looks longingly at it. <laughs> and Summer's I'm home. I'm obsessed with Taylor. I'm just obsessed with her. <laughs> I know. <Sorry>. She's, <laughs> she's so good. And and Summer comes home to the empty dorm and the vo- voicemail. And he says he's given her some space. And the and the yeah. super superhero warrior princess. It was a pretty, 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 pretty montage. And that's the episode. I love the way you played that that um, moment by yourself, Rachel, because it's it's ambivalent. It doesn't feel like you're sad there. It feels mm-hmm. like you're evaluating the situation. I thought it was really beautifully played. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you. the metamorphosis is is ever changing actually ever. and everybody is metamorphosizing That's right <laughs> well we have some voicemails for us for norman oh oh <laughs> hi my name is sana i'm from finland um i really really hope my message makes it to the podcast because my last one didn't my questions to you guys would be uh firstly how did it feel working with a new uh key uh group of of characters and cast um in season four because that changed quite a bit and i imagine the dynamic changed uh and secondly how is it to be a director uh on shows um such as now having learned in the podcast that's a lot of times the directors uh, only do one episode. So you don't really have a history of having done multiple episodes during the show. Um, I find that very intriguing. Um, and how do you uh, work with that and deal with that in different shows? Thank you. She's right that sometimes directors are only a guest on a sh- but then on the OC you do re- uh, multiple. So there's a difference. Yeah, in that, I, f- right? I feel like uh, particularly in the fourth season, it, as I remember, it was me and Michael Lang and maybe Ian. Patrick Norris and Ian. And then I think that uh, John Stevens directed one episode. But I, I, I don't feel like there were a lot of different directors in season four. I feel like uh, I did. I know I did three of them in season four. Usually on a show, what you're looking for is a group of directors that vibe with the cast and crew. And then those directors tend to come back a lot. I have done shows where I'm, I'm, I'm kind of one and out, but not very many. Most of, most of my career has been working on shows, doing multiple episodes. But the job is to come in, look at the show, and adjust your directing style to what the show is doing and what the show needs. I was very lucky in working on the OC that I was there from the very, very beginning, having edited the pilot, and I directed second unit on the series finale, so I was there till the very end. So I think that um, in this situation, I was very much at home with everyone and felt like I had a strong relationship with everyone. I do remember it being very fun in season four because we we did have a, a whole different, there was a whole different vibe to the party at that point. I remember the same thing also knowing that they were writing for Julie's character. And I also can notice an even more relaxation in the performances and I, even mine. I mean, that's just my experience. I can see that I was taking more, more, I don't know, risks or I was just trying things that were it, compared to the first season, which I think was much more of a noopsy character. And mm-hmm. then I kind of grounded her and let her just be even more a little bit like me personally. So mm-hmm. did you find that Rachel at all? Yeah. <laughs> And, and every every character not for was me. Going I'm talking asking you about change. you. Sorry, <laughs> but every character was going through some major change in that in that season too. So there was more interesting stuff to play. There was more interesting stuff to act. I, I would guess. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Is that yeah. how you remember it, Rachel? Do you remember it that way? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel was also doing jumper at the same time. So yeah. So it she was. was going back and forth <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if that's why they wrote like the space, you know, so there wasn't as much of Seth yeah. and Summer. Or I don't know. Maybe that was later. Well, there sure. there was also the, the storylines were bifurcated, you know, so there were there wasn't a lot. You'll notice that there wasn't a lot of um, people crossing into other people's stories at this point. Mm. Right. And part of that, I think, was to accommodate your schedule. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can yeah, tell I in the structure yeah. sometimes how, how, how much Rachel was working that week on another thing. <laughs> 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 we have one more email. I mean, a uh, voicemail. Thank you for your question, by the way. Hi, this is Mary from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My question for this episode is, did the cast dynamic feel different in season four with Marissa gone and the other cast added? Um, and also, do you think that Summer's metamorphosis would have happened if Seth had been in Rhode Island with her? Oh. Um, and Rachel, please do a Heart of Dixie rewatch podcast. I would love to hear that. Um, I think you're both great and love the podcast. Thanks. Bye. Aw, that was nice. Yeah. Heart of Dixie can live on. Norman, you come on for that one too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder if Summer would have, with if Seth was there. Probably not. Don't you find like when your comfort zone or your security blanket is with you, you don't tend to grow as easily? I'm just throwing that out there. That's like a really, you know, deep thought by me. But <laughs> yeah, I feel like maybe, probably not. I mean, I found that when you're away from a significant other, I mean, when we have to leave and be on set somewhere else, you're you kind of go into survival mode. And because you're not you don't have that other person that you're constantly engaged with. So you do go through different changes. So, yeah, maybe being away from Seth would would have or maybe being together with Seth, Seth, her her metamorphosis would have had different colors. For sure. You you adapt. You adapt. You adapt if you're without the people that that make you feel comfortable. You adapt. And, you know, we all have different personalities with different people. Mm -hmm. There's some people that we have one personality and we're with somebody else and we have a different one. And um, I think that that goes for, it ties back into the previous question. As a uh, director bouncing from show to show, you also adapt. You go into a different show and you have a whole different way of being on that show. Right, it's right. A, it's a different experience altogether. And to right. answer her other question, I think we kind of mentioned that yes, it was fun. It was great to have great new characters, and I mean, it was it was different. I mean, it wasn't that different, but it was a slightly different energy um, in mm-hmm. season four. Um, for sure. But, but the writers were really, really energetic about what they were putting out too, and really happy with what they were doing. Yeah, and I like how light Ben is uh, becoming. Yes, he smiles a lot more. I've noticed. He smiles a lot more. <laughs> well, that's that's what I was speaking to when I said that Autumn. I felt really um, she she brought his game up. She's not the tragic character of Marissa. She's a completely different person with different emotions and a different reality, and it evokes a different. Yeah, it's a different. It, it was a different show in season four. Right. It became right. a different show. Yeah. So we have an email. This is funny. We have an email <laughs> from Jess. I love it. Are you ready for this? This is awesome. Hi, bitches. <laughs> I'm not sure if Tate will appear on the podcast before the finale, but I have a confession. I was the caller on Watch What Happens Live that asked who the biggest diva was a few years back. Little did I know that would cause such a stir amongst the cast <laughs> and asked by the biggest fan nonetheless. It was picked up on Radar Online and replayed when Adam was promoting a project on Bravo too. Additionally, I'm still blushing after all these years as I'm listening to ancillary fan podcasts and this incident was also brought up. The sad part, the producer at Watch What Happens Live prompted me to ask the question. I'm sure that's no surprise to you both. Wish I could recall what my initial question was when I called in. Please tell Tate sorry. (laughs) I know it was mentioned before on the pod, but my TV trajectory from the OC as a young grade school high school student to, what is this? Oh, Real Housewives of Orange County. And of course, my obsession with Andy Cohen. Does Sandy and Seth have a family in St. Louis, Andy's hometown? (laughs) Can accurately stem back to the OC on Fox. I think Josh would agree. Thank you so much for committing to this podcast. It has been a great listen and look forward to it every week. I love catching up with all the characters and of course, Melinda and Rachel. I'm glad to hear all is well with you both since (laughs) since the good old OC days. Thanks. Jess, in parentheses, not Sathers, from Chicago. Isn't that a great story? (laughs) Hilarious. She's the one that prompted Tate to say we're all assholes. Right. And then they replayed (laughs) it for Adam three weeks later live. I mean, these shows put people really in the hot seat. And it was not like 
it, it didn't evoke great emotions from everyone. So. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Jess, well, you created a lot of great content. So thank you thank for you. that. <laughs> Thanks for coming clean there, Jess. No, but oh, yes, the producers always try to control that stuff. It's so funny. I love it. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. I love it. Well, thank we love you. you, Norman. Thank you so much. Love and you too. One of the great mm-hmm. things about this podcast is reconnecting with everyone and I'll see you soon, right? We're mm-hmm. having dinner. <laughs> yes, yes. I'll be in, I'll be in LA in March and April. Yeah. Nice. So. We're trying to get everyone together, Rachel. We're going to try. Yeah, well, let's do it. We need to do it. Yeah. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. Okay. Very Sounds good. Fun. All right. Thank you so much. And Thanks, Norman. Oh, thank you so much for listening. Follow, rate, and review. Welcome to the OC Bitches wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like to watch us, check it out on YouTube. And you can now listen to bonus features as well as season one and season two of the OC Bitches on Cast Plus. Bye, bitches. Welcome to the OC Bitches is brought to you by Cast Media. Executive produced by Colin Thompson, Harris Lane, produced by Katie Kurtwright, edited by Parker Flores and our technical engineers, Travis Holden and Dustin Park.